Okay, so now we're on. Um, I'm going to be talking about lecture capture, so I should actually cap capture the lecture. So uh, that is the uh, the most important aspect of the technology I'll be talking about today. So I have been interested for the last um, well this year, essentially since last spring semester, uh, about the potential for teaching from my tablet. And so what I want to do today is, first of all, just to talk about how I got into this a little bit. Uh, and then I'll give you a little bit of an uh, overview of some of the applications, some of the apps that could be used. Um, I will, well, I'll, I'll talk about that later. Um, so, you know, I think the, the ability to teach from a tablet uh, is very natural. Uh, there's only a, just a one limitation or two that I'm still working through that I'll mention when I get to that. But one side effect that I found from doing um, my classroom teaching from the tablet is that it had a very simple way to actually capture the lectures that were going on in the classroom. And uh, I'll talk about uh, that process, the workflow that I use. Uh, in my case, it relies quite a bit on cloud services. So uh, we'll, I'll be talking about uh, my um, you know, Dropbox account, Box.net, my Google Drive, you, uh, YouTube, all of those services really tie in together with this consumer level technology to drive a, a system that allows me to capture lectures. Um, so a little bit about how this all came about. Because I had no idea spring 2014 semester. I, I had no brilliant idea, oh, let me see about teaching from a tablet and what I could do for lecture capture. I was planning to go into the classroom the way I normally did and uh, bring up the Symposium smart tablet uh, that's in our, all of our instructor stations and fire up the smart tools. You know, when I do do lecture in class, which is probably about half the time, you know, I try to break it up with other kinds of teaching approaches. But when I do do lectures, I would bring them up in the smart tools into the whiteboard uh, system there, be able to annotate those uh, slides as I'm doing my lectures, and then export those annotated slides to uh, PDFs at the end of the, of the session that I would then upload into Moodle so that students would have you know, um, an idea of, of what we talked about. So I got into the classroom, and for a variety of reasons, this classroom had no functioning smart tools. So I kind of winged it the first day, and did a little song and dance like I'm doing up here. Uh, but I thought, well, rather than trying to get them to actually put the smart tools up on the, because uh, we didn't really have a, a touch, um, um, a monitor in that classroom and so forth. And I thought, well, I have a tablet. Um, you know, I should be able to find something from my tablet that I can use to um, to present my lectures when I'm doing lectures, do the annotations that I was uh, used to doing, and so forth. Uh, so I would like to say that I then sat down and did an exhaustive evaluation of all of these potential apps that could be done, weighing, the, weighing their pros and cons and so forth. But I had lectured a couple of days. So I found something. I found something I liked. And um, actually, I think uh, I, I think I um, stumbled upon a, a very good solution that I wanted to describe to you today. OK. So before I get to that, though, I just I did want to do a little bit of a service here to show you some of the whiteboard apps that are commonly referred to if you do a search for what are the best whiteboard apps for you know, your Android or, or Mac OS device. EduCreations is um, you know, almost always mentioned in these reviews of whiteboard apps. Educa EduCreations is not only an app, but it's also an online community. You sign up at the online community as either an instructor or as a student. Um, they've got a, a wide, a very active community online for sharing lectures that, uh, that teachers create with their, with their iPad apps. 
Uh, you'll find if you uh, work through this literature that a lot of this activity is, is focused on um, K through 12 uh, uh, sphere. There's a lot of tablet programs and one-to-one -one programs and so forth in the K through 12 uh, environment. And there's a lot of, of interest in, um, um, you know, using these whiteboards uh, as a way to make the tablets more useful in the K through 12 classroom. So edu edu creations is one I would you look into. Um, the Show Me is a very nice, stripped down, very straightforward whiteboard. Uh, makes it very easy to draw on your tablet the way you would draw on the whiteboard in the classroom. Um, Screen Chomp, another one. This one is uh, from TechSmith, the same folks that uh, make uh, Camtasia and Snagit and, and those tools. Um, Screen Chomp in particular seem to be very targeted at the younger K through 12 environment because of some of the cutesy tools um, and, uh, and, and uh, stamps and so forth that come with it. Uh, sync space, they focus on the ability for you to share whiteboards with someone else who's also running a sync space app so you can collaborate in real time on the same virtual whiteboard, um, theoretically from anywhere in the world. Just a couple more, Doceri, um, this is primarily, this is one of the more expensive apps, it's a whole $4.99. So, uh, you know, it's probably going to break your IT budget, but uh, if you really want to spring for, for a uh, top-of-the-line app, um, you can th consider those. Uh, Jot. Jot, again, has a free and paid version. Uh, again, they're trying to focus on a very stripped-down, streamlined kind of whiteboard application. And here's the one, uh, Explain Everything, is the one that I stumbled upon um, in, to begin with. It's the one I've been working with all, all, all along, and I, I just love it. I mean, I can't imagine doing a lecture kind of course without having this kind of functionality available um, to me at this point. So I'm actually in Explain Everything right now, giving my presentation. Um, you can see... the uh, kind of tools that are available uh, along the side here, you know, the kinds of uh, whiteboard tools you'd expect, you know, the ability to annotate, the ability to uh, use a laser pointer, um, you know, you can erase things, you can put on text, you can add materials to your slides, uh, and I'll talk a little bit in more detail about the, you know, the kind of workflow process that I do uh, for my presentations um, and so forth. This is the kind of uh, experience my students have in the middle of one of my lectures. Here I'm doing a, a lecture on planetary thermostats, uh, essentially uh, the... Uh, carbonate silicate cycle and how that those elements are recycled through the crust and the atmosphere and how that regulates planetary climates but you know the uh, what I find is um, you can if you're doing a PowerPoint presentation the way I would normally have done you know a decade or so ago you you have some abilities to use the mouse to kind of try to draw on the PowerPoints never really works very well but um, my other big investment, besides the two dollars and ninety-nine cents for explain everything, is a uh, you know eight-dollar stylus, and so um, you've got a situation where, as I'm talking along, so here in this part of the slide, I was trying to get across the idea of positive feedback, and so I was able to actually draw on the slide to talk about how as temperatures, uh, how as carbon dioxide rises. Temperature rises, which leads to decrease, uh, to increase uh, weathering of silicate materials, which tends to draw carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, and so there's a negative feedback. So it's a very natural approach to providing, um, you know, um, a kind of lecture presentation in the classroom. 
And uh, what you can see that I noticed um, after the first lecture or so, I kind of wondered, well, what's going on with this, uh, this little record button down here? And so I uh, realized, well, as easy as I'm lecturing in class, I can be recording that lecture. And uh, you can see in the recording tracks, there is an audio track here that will pick up whatever is uh, you know, being picked up by the, um, mic um, by the microphone on the tablet. And this works fairly well. I mean, I would be teaching in a classroom with 40 students. And um, you know, a lot of the back and forth that I have with my students actually is, is, is captured into the lecture capture. And then the other track uh, is all of the tool activities. You know, if I've selected a laser pointer, if I've selected a uh, um, you know, um, pencil to draw on the slides, those are all recorded there. It's a pretty, um, pretty bare bones kind of recording. You're not going to be doing a lot of, uh, of uh, editing and shifting audio around. It's kind of a one take through kind of recording. If you actually go back to um, the slide and you re record some more, um, you have to be careful that you don't actually over um, you know, wipe out your previous recording. So it's, it's best for kind of a, let's go through these slides and record what's going on. So I won't uh, take the time, I think, to uh, pop out to YouTube to um, to look at this particular example. I was talking in class about how the Mars orbital laser altimeter worked by uh, sending down laser pulses from um, the Mars Global Surveyor from orbit to time those pulses to see you know, what the elevation was to measure the terrain, the digital terrain model of Mars. But what I thought I'd do instead is actually just show you um, most of the time when I'm doing these presentations, I will, uh, as I'll show in a minute, start off with an actual presentation with slides. Um, and I will um, export those to a PDF file, which I can bring in to explain everything, which then separates the pages of the PDF into separate pages or separate slides and um, in explain everything. And so mostly I'm, I'm talking about on top of pre-existing uh, slides and I'm annotating as I'm going along. But what I found very quickly is that uh, because you are working in a live presentation app rather than just showing a PowerPoint or a Prezi presentation, you have the ability to actually place objects on the slides. So in this case, what we have here is um, just an image of the Mars Global Surveyor that uh, I downloaded to Dropbox where I keep my presentation so that I could bring it into this presentation. And let's actually uh, make it a little smaller there. Okay. So I could say, well, here we've got a, you know, I should use red. We're talking about Mars after all. Uh, you know, here's... Here's the terrain on Mars that we're trying to measure from orbit what the altitude is. And uh, it's a laser altimeter, so I'm thinking in, while I'm doing class, oh, laser. Well, I've got a laser pointer. Let's make a nice fuzzy one. So essentially what's going on in, um, to do these measurements is the orbiter is going uh, along in its orbit. And periodically, it sends down a laser pulse, bing, bing. And that time to come back uh, allows the orbiter to measure the height of that piece of ground. And then you can move along further in the orbit, and uh, you know, sends down another pulse, and times it back. And um, so I went on for like five minutes, because I was just having so much fun. You know, bing, bing, and the students were just having a ball. So, you know, it has a lot of opportunities uh, beyond just um, a regular presentation. Won't uh, delabor some of this, these teaching aspects, but uh, one thing I find nice is that, uh, you know, I can 
zoom materials up very naturally we're using the gestures that we're all familiar with from the tablet. I can say, okay, now remember the Pavonis Mons uh, uh, volcano here. It's on the equator. And, you know, as I move this object around, those annotations just go right with it. So it's really cool. And uh, I'm not actually hooked up to audio here, but you can actually embed videos within your Explain Everything. And uh, if you're close enough, you can hear from my tablet. Well, let's zoom ahead a little bit. So we've got this scene from Mission to Mars where they discover this uh, planetarium. Uh, because it's in your presentation, you can pause it at any time and let, and you know bring out a laser pointer to say, okay, well uh, here's you know here's where they're showing Mars. So there's a lot of of opportunities from a teaching perspective, but um, that's not what you came here to listen about. You came here to talk about uh, lecture capture. So um, just a little bit more about again how I tend to build these presentations. I've got my presentations built. I don't tend to generally build my presentations and explain everything or, or any of the other whiteboard apps on the tablet. I would normally do that in Google Docs as a Google Docs slides uh, document. And so um, you have the ability to using the um, add an object tools to bring in files like uh, PDFs of your slide presentations um, or that video clip from Mission to Mars I brought in as a file or that um, image of Mars Global Surveyor. But you can also um, you know, use the camera on your tablet to capture a video directly and to explain everything. You can embed a web browser. I don't tend to do this a lot in my presentations, but you would be able to go out to the web from within your explain everything presentation. The nice thing there is that you can actually record that, you know, going out to visit that, that website. Okay, again, just a little bit more about, uh, um, you know, you can bring in PDFs, uh, PowerPoints, Keynote files, uh, all of these different uh, file types, and determine whether or not you want to explain everything to disarticulate those presentations into corresponding slides and explain everything. Um, the one limitation I'm still dealing with is the same limitation I'm dealing with here. We have not been able yet to get uh, my tablet talking to my Apple TV unit on the campus network. I know it's possible, and I've heard, you know, I've had people at other student conferences say, oh yeah, we can tell you how to do that, but we just haven't figured it out yet. So I am, you know, as much as I would like to be able to walk around the classroom or walk around uh, the session here, I tend to be tethered to my um, instructor station at, at this point, although I will get that fixed by spring when I teach again. Okay, so... Um, What's this all mean for lecture capture? Well, um, you know, as, as you notice, um, you know, I did remember to actually press the record button when I started the presentation here. So I'm capturing this lecture as we're going through it. Um, and I found very, you know, must hit record button. I need to have that kind of tattooed, not on my forehead, because I wouldn't be able to see it, but somewhere where I can see it. Um, I have, you know, bombed a couple of lecture captures by forgetting to hit the record. But generally speaking, in this situation, you're talking about capturing the lecture as a very natural outgrowth of giving the lecture. There's not any kind of extra paraphernalia you have to deal with. Uh, this kind of record function is built into almost all of these whiteboard apps. You know, so no matter, I mean, if you, even if you go with one of the free apps or you spend the $2.99 for Explain Everything, uh, it's just a, a feature that, that comes along. And I find that, you know, in the past I had, what I was able to give my students was uh, uh, captures of the slides that we saw, in, that we used in the presentation, and static notes that, um, you know, 
ended up on the slides by the end of the by the end of the session. Now I can actually give them a recording of how we're going through the slides, the you know the sequence in which I am noting, annotating the slides, my commentary on the slides as well. So it's a much more richer capture of what was going on in the classroom than what I had before. So I guess I should be happy that. Smart Tools was not available in the classroom I was teaching in this last spring, because otherwise I would not have stumbled across this. Uh, I'll show you in a, little, in a minute, but uh, most of these apps also either natively export to um, you, your YouTube account or, say, to EduCreations, in the case of the EduCreations app. Um, and so once my... Uh, little captured lectures are up on my YouTube channel by default in an unlisted format so I can either make them public or keep them unlisted I can then um, easily bring them into Moodle or, or you know Blackboard whatever LMS you're using um, um, you can post them to your blog you can you know do whatever you want create a playlist on YouTube that you send your students to so there's a lot of uh, flexible um, uses for this DIY kind of uh, lecture capture approach. I mean, it's cheap. I spent $2.99 for the app um, and maybe $8 for the stylus. The most expensive thing I had to buy, you know, since I already had the tablet, was the VGA connector because, um, because we couldn't get the wireless presentation working. And, you know, I'm totally self-sufficient. I don't have to worry about an Echo 360 license being set up on campus. You know, I don't have to worry about, you know, who's managing the servers or anything like that. I mean, if YouTube ever goes down, civilization will come to an end as we know it anyway. So, you know, who cares? Um, some of the downsides, though, in comparing this kind of consumer-level DIY approach to a more enterprise-level solution. Uh, my students are kind of stuck with, uh, you know, real-time playback of YouTube clips. Many of the enterprise lecture capture systems will provide a, um, you know, a slide-based um, ability to access the recordings, which I clearly don't have because I'm just exporting a, a movie. Um, I have not, at this point, been very... I've not been a good boy about making sure that my YouTube uh, clips are captioned. So, I mean, there's that issue that, um, that I will have to deal with at some point. Um, uh, I mean, I don't have the same level of analytics of, you know, student use and, you know, which students are logging in to use it and when and at what, you know, what time of the day and all of that stuff that you would get with, with a enterprise level lect lecture capture system. I mean, um, Moodle will give me some idea of usage, and I've got, you know, the basic YouTube analytics, which I find very depressing, given that I'm encouraging my students to go back and review these clips. Um, but it's clearly not the same level of analytics you would get with an enterprise system. And the, the uh, LMS tie-in is, it's all manual. I mean, it's not difficult, but it's not a kind of, I'm a, I'm a lecturer, I'm going to go into the classroom, I've got my slides on the computer, I'm going to start up my, the presentation, I'm going to click the record button, and everything's going to happen in the background for me. I mean, this is not rocket science what I'm doing, but, you know, it does take some initiative on the part of the faculty. So there are those, there's those, uh, you know, balances between um, this, this, DIY approach versus an enterprise level approach to lecture capture. Um, I won't belabor this slide, but I mean, um, this just shows the outputting uh, settings that you can select and explain everything. Um, you know, you can com control what kind of quality you want to for creating your uh, YouTube videos. Uh, essentially, if we look down here, you know, all I have to do at the end of 
the presentation or when I get back to my office and you know I've got a minute to think about it, I can just click that export to video option, tell it um, one time that I want those videos to go to my YouTube channel, and from then on, um, you know, explain everything, negotiates everything with my YouTube account to upload the videos after the you, after explain everything is processed the slideshow into a video file format. When you're capturing video, it's saving it locally. Uh, it's explaining it as a it's saving it as an explain everything project file, which. No, no. Um, in fact, I haven't bothered. I got here after driving up four hours this morning just in time to register, have some lunch, and get here to find no projector in the room. So I have not bothered getting my tablet on the network yet, um, and it's working fine. It's all just local at this point. Um, How long are your lectures typically that you're doing? Uh, well, I, I try to go 10, 15 minutes, but if you look at my YouTube channel, you see excruciatingly long 40, 45, 50 minute lectures that I should not be subjecting my students to. But I mean, there's not any kind of limitation here. The, um, the recording is not being recorded as a video. It's being recorded, well, the audio, the audio track is definitely being recorded. But in terms of you know, what is going on in terms of the annotation and switching to the next slide and so forth, that's just being stored as, you know, um, tool records and so the export process you know depending on the lecture might take 10 to 20 minutes for um, explain everything to crank through the slides and the, match it up with the audio track and dr lay in the annotations and draw the laser pulses back and forth uh, and export that to a video which then gets uploaded uh, to YouTube. Are you, are you using the 64 gig iPad there, or, I mean, does storage matter? No, this is, um, this is a couple generations back, so I think I've got maybe 16 gig, maybe 32, but certainly not 64. So because it, because it generates the video file only on export yeah. storage? Yeah, it's not, it's not storing those on the, yeah. When you do a lecture, if you're lecturing for 40, Break it up into little smaller subject chunks. Um, yeah, I, I could, uh, I, I should perhaps. Uh, in the past, I obviously haven't, because I do have those forty-five minute long lectures up in my YouTube channel. Um, you know, with with the back and forth with the students and so forth, the lectures always go longer than you know I expect, and so. Um, yeah, I've, I've got the slides that we need to talk about to cover a particular thing, and 40 minutes later, it's, oh, well, I guess it's 40 minutes later. Yeah, that's, that's me as a teacher. And, Do you edit these at all? Um, yes, you could. Um, let me restart. Could you import that into... Um Camtasia. Well, export it as a to share with the uh, what is it? I'm drawing a blank. Um, you, you might be able to, to do some post processing, <coughs> clearly not very much, and explain everything. Uh, obviously, it's going to be uploaded to YouTube, YouTube is going to make it. Um, you know, flash video or HTML5 or whatever they're doing these days. Uh, and uh, I don't recall actually, I mean I could export the video to my box.net account and then I'm not sure what format it would be in. Well, um, it would be MP4, a high quality MP4. And so you could take that MP4 into whatever video editing t software you wanted to. Um, I think my students should just be grateful enough that the lectures yeah. are up there. <laughs> that. Anyway, so, so what kind of analytics are you seeing? How much do they watch these? Um, I, you know, I have a class of thirty some students. Some get a dozen views. Some get thirty five views. So, um, 
uh, you know, and I can't tell, is there going to be a spike before, you know, midterm? I actually oftentimes don't have midterms with my classes anyway, so it's not the same kind of driver for accessing the lecture captures like there are in some other courses. Uh, I have not, actually. I mean, I'm putting these up in unlisted videos on my YouTube account, and I'm, I'm presenting them back to the students in our Moodle course. I'm mean, just embedding them in Moodle. And so, um, you know, it's a fairly private use of the video. Uh, not bothered about uh, waivers. You know, and unless, the, unless they are really very vocal in class, they're not going to be showing up in any kind of audio format in the in the in the videos. And I'm not. I mean, there's no video. There's no talking head of me. There's no talking head of the students. It is basically capturing the slides and the conversation. So, uh, just my YouTube channel. So, um, how does this all work for me? Um, this part over here is what you came to hear, lecture capture, and this part here is lecturing, and this part here is archiving. So as I said before, um, you know, I haven't used PowerPoint for a long time. I've never really gotten into Prezi. I use Google Docs to, if I'm going to make a presentation, that's where I create them. Now I could, on my Drive account, on my Google Drive account, save a copy of the um, slides presentation as a PDF or as a PowerPoint. Um, but I don't um, because I'm, I don't know, compulsive or an idiot or whatever. Um, what I will do is I will create the slides essentially in slides on my Google Drive account. When I'm ready, I'll save a PDF of those onto my Dropbox account. I've always, you know, I've had Dropbox in my Google Drive account, and I've had bought my Box.net account for a long time and never really figured out, you know, why do I have this? What am I going to use this for? But by having these multiple cloud-based storage, it gives me a way to kind of partition my workflow. So uh, my Dropbox account is where the PDFs that I'm going to be talking about in class are stored in waiting for me to bring those PDFs into the Explain Everything app. Okay, so I'll cycle them in as I'm getting ready to do, to do those, those lecture sessions that are coming up. Um, you could, you know, just create a P, uh, PowerPoint on your computer and make, take that directly in to Explain Everything. Uh, you know, it could be a keynote presentation, you, you know, any kind of, of document file format. So that's really all I need to do to uh, handle lecturing. Um, but as long as I remember to hit the record button, then after the fact, I can export to YouTube, have explain everything, export the <coughs> captured lecture to YouTube, and then I can um, just embed uh, those into Moodle. And what I use the, my box.net uh, account for is archive. I mean, I've got the slides here, and I've got the recorded lectures here. There's no reason why I couldn't really just delete the project files um, <coughs> off of my tablet to, clean, to, to make room. But I haven't been doing that yet. I have so far said, well, I've got my box.net account. Let me just... Uh, click the um, export button here, which is one of these, um, or is it that one, one of these, um, and uh, archive the actual explain everything project file there. So if you ever want to go back and re-export it to YouTube for some reason, or you know, export it to my um, box.net account as a, as a MP4 file so I can edit it, then I have those project files and I do that before I delete the project file off of my tablet to, to free up space on the tablet. So the, I mean, the workflow 
looks a little messy. It's not a kind of one button, but you know, uh, if I'm doing this as a faculty member to actually just do my lectures, it is almost kind of a one, a two button. I have to remember to hit the record button on explain everything, and then I have to export to uh, YouTube. Well, three button, and then I have to decide that I'm going to bring it into uh, Moodle. So, like I said, it's not rocket science, and it's cheap, and it's under my control, and I, you know, feel good about it. Um, so, I mean, these are just all of the different uh, cloud-based tools that uh, explain everything um, interfaces with natively. I've not bothered, I don't use Facebook for professional activities, so I've not bothered, you know, hooking and explain everything into Facebook, but I could, you know, publicize my presentations to Twitter if I wanted to, um, so forth. Uh, not yet. Uh, I mean, I've always been kind of a, let's try not to do massive lectures, let's try to make the lectures Socratic as much as possible, let's, you know, try to do back and forth. Uh, so my, my lecture style hasn't changed. But what I am planning for next semester, you know, given this setup, there's no reason why I can't do these mini lectures ahead before the class and try to keep them at 15 minutes and not make them go 40 minutes. And so put up a mini lecture on the Copernican Revolution that my students will dutifully watch ahead of time because they've got a quiz in Moodle that will ensure that they watch it ahead of time so that when they come into the classroom, they can do a simulation exercise or uh, you know, an actual application where they are uh, making, using poker chips to represent the sun and the earth and Venus and making pre uh, predictions about, you know, what, what would we see about the phases of Venus if, uh, if we're talking about geocentric versus heliocentric models of the universe and what do you predict and then what do we see and congratulations, you just did what Galileo did, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm hoping to use this approach to actually flip my class uh, in order to be able to move the lectures out of lecture and bring in more applications like that. I did nicely with uh, that slide, and I'm done. So I, I guess the, the take-home message is, you know, th this DIY solution is cheap, flexible, it's under the control of the faculty member, uh, but, you know, clearly it's not going to give you all the bells and whistles of an enterprise system. But I think as, you know, these consumer technologies get better and better and better, it's going to force us to, I mean, we may not throw out the enterprise systems ever, but, um, you know, you, we're going to have to be more intentional about thinking about them. I mean, which enterprise systems really do we need? We don't have a lecture capture system, uh, enterprise lecture capture system at purchase. You know, it's something that's come up multiple times at, on the Instructional Technology Advisory Committee. There's always been faculty pushback. Well, you know, maybe we don't have to sink a lot of money into a commercial enterprise system if those faculty are interested in doing lecture capture, can be given tablets and, and styluses, and here's how you use to explain everything. So, um, I think it's going to be interesting days ahead. That, I mean, I, I, you know, I like the questions we had so far, but, you know, if there are more questions, uh, ask them now, or you can also get to my email. How many instructors are doing this on your campus? Me, and uh, I have one faculty member who is also, and I've loaned a tablet to. Um, are there any other instructors that are just bringing their own tablets in? I don't know, but I do hope to, especially if we can get the, the issue of having the, you know, the wireless connection to the projector figured out so I don't have to buy a whole bunch of VGA adapters. I'm hoping to take a dozen of our iPads that are sitting around uh, in our center a fair amount of time and creating a faculty community practice for next semester saying, 
you know, if faculty are interested in just in general teaching from a tablet and, uh, you know, any faculty are interested in playing around with lecture capture, let's get together and do a, a community practice and uh, see what lessons we can learn. But, you know, and until I can get the iPads untethered from the instructor station, that's going to be a big a limitation. Well, I saw you have the TV in the picture. Is yeah, it not working? I, well, I, and I brought it along, actually, and I see that there's an HDMI input on the projector, but, and if I would have gotten here at, like, 10 o'clock and the projector would have been in the room, I you know, might have been untethered. Uh, Apple TV requires uh, certain network ports to be opened up that our network services have decided at this point not to open up. So... Um, there's supposedly some way that we can install a profile on the Apple TV unit itself that will bypass those network restrictions or, I mean, we were looking at Air Server or, you know, some other, you know, software-based tools, so we wouldn't, have to have, we wouldn't have to have an Apple TV unit in every classroom. It wouldn't matter whether it's a Mac or a Windows uh, computer in the instructor station. But, you know, we don't have that figured out yet. And so when I get back uh, this, this evening, I'm going to put in a work order and say, okay, let's get serious about this because I'm planning for my class and I also want to do this community practice. What the, what is it, Doseri? Doseri. Isn't that um, a way for you to connect the tablet to whatever instructor station you're in the room and use that to get... So basically you would be well, that's a good point. I've not played around with Doseri very much, but it has a uh, it has a client that goes on the workstation. I've only heard of it from somebody else. I haven't, okay. I haven't played with it, but my understanding is if we had a, an instructor station in the room, you could be controlling that. So you'd be using that for the projection. the device in the, in the wherever in the ceiling, when you've got the Doseri, the laptop, the Apple TV. Your VGA cable is cheaper than that setup, um, to yeah. be honest. It's yeah. the bottom line. But I'll put my guy in contact with you to tell you how we did that to make my network guys happy, too. Great. Because my network guys are kind of so... They're a little there. The projector that you can't talk to the internet necessarily at the same time. Yeah. yeah. That's your choice. Yeah. I mean, this my Apple TV tablet setup works just beautifully at home, where it's yeah, meant to, where it's meant to work. Not an enterprise system. I'm not letting yeah. Apple TV on our network. Yeah, yeah. Right. And stuff. Does anybody else do it? The Apple TV its own network, so that, like I say, you can talk to the projector, but you can't necessarily also talk to the internet at the same time. We also choices. We also have an Epson projector that has wireless built in that we're using to do that, so we don't have to tether. Okay. And stuff. It's just something we've just started doing. It took yes. a while to tweak, but. It, it eliminates the Apple TV. The projector has to be networked. But there's soft, it has to be wired to a PC. PC has the software on it, but you can be untethered then at that yeah. point. The projector was under $700. Oh, nice. Okay. So. I think some of it is the Bonjour protocol. Though. Yeah. 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 We know, so we know how to figure it out. But there's also, there's also our network guys are like, that's, that's a very chatty protocol. Like, yeah. 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 People can not do You don't want it on wireless. It's wireless. You don't want yeah. the Bonjour protocol right. on wireless. Yeah. So that's our story, um, and um, I think there's some interesting aspects to it, but uh, it's still under development. Oh. Well, if you if you read the white papers like the you can get from Echo 360, uh, they say that uh, it has all sorts of positive. I mean, the 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 qualms are well, if I record my lectures, why will students come to class anymore? And that's been fairly well um, debunked. That in in situations where you do have lecture capture in place, you don't see a big increase in in um, 
and absenteeism. Um, I mean, students st students are using appear to be using the lecture captures very strategically. Um, why? If you have the, uh, um, I mean, it, it, it's still a real time experience of the lecture kind of situation. It's not like well, unless you've got some situations to play back the lecture captures at you know one point five x time, you're still going to be as a student investing a chunk of time. So you, you want to not just miss class and rely on the lecture capture. You want to be in class because the lecture capture is not going to capture everything that's going on in the classroom. But, you know, you've got the exam coming up or you know that you're fuzzy on the concepts that you know, were dealt with on this particular slide. With the enterprise level systems, oftentimes the students can go to that lecture capture and, you know, click on that slide and get, you know, right there. With my YouTube videos, they would have to kind of scrub through and say, okay, yeah, that, that, lec that slide was about halfway through the lecture. I'm really fuzzy about So let me fast forward through 27 of the 40 minutes to get to, you know, the part. So, uh, you know, students, they're, they're a resource that students can use strategically. Okay. Well, thank you very much.